Hello everyone in the YouTube world and my professor, Carlos Vargas. My name is Karen Dietz and today I will be doing this video as a presentation for my human sexuality class. I will be going over the definition, symptoms, theories about the cause, possible consequences, a person who is diagnosed, why it was developed in said person, how it has affected said person, and my opinion over necrophilia. So I'll go ahead and start off with the definition of necrophilia. According to Merriam-Webster, necrophilia is defined as an obsession with and usually erotic interest in or stimulation by a corpse. When reading more into necrophilia, I found out that it can fall under three different categories. The first being necrophilic homicide, which is to kill and have sexual intercourse with the corpse. The second is necrophilic fantasy, which is where a person strictly fantasizes about sexual activity with the corpse but never actually pursues it. And the third is regular necrophilia, which is where a person uses only the corpse to satisfy his or her sexual instincts. And I say his or her because obviously both men and women can be necrophiles, but surprisingly enough, 90% of necrophiles are men, leaving only 10% to women. Next, I'm going to talk about the symptoms. I found a list of symptoms on a medical website called medico.com, in case you want to go ahead and take a look at it. I'm just going to go ahead and read them out loud. Starting off with the inability to relate to the living, fascination with foul odors, odors language that includes numerous death-related or the expiratory system, appreciation for machines over people, insensitivity to the tragedy of losing a life, dry skin, weird, dry skin, interest in sickness and death, incapacity to laugh, a view that the past is more real than the present, a belief that resolving conflict needs force or violence, compartmentalization of emotion and will, worship of techniques or devices of destruction, tends to break and mutilate small things, can be expressed more drastically as self-mutilation, and enthralled by skeletons. Following, I'm gonna talk about the theories about the causes. So I was able to find a few theories. One was constant rejection. A lot of times, necrophiles um, are constantly rejected in their love life, so then they choose to seek a relation where they cannot be rejected, which is obviously where the corpse comes in because they're not alive and they can't reject you. Another is develops an exciting fantasy after exposure to corpse, which is basically just that. Another is um, this person may have fear of the dead and in an attempt of overcoming that fear, they end up developing a desire. Low self-esteem was a big one because when a necrophile feels a lot of low self-esteem, they're able to feel empowered over the corpse which they are controlling, in a sense. And another which made the most sense to me, I guess, would be to reunite with a lost partner. I'm gonna go over the possible consequences now. The possible consequences do vary just because there's different laws according to each state. The majority of states do have laws against necrophilia, although these laws are very murky. But with that being said, there are nine states that do not have anything, any sort of law that are addressing necrophilia. These nine states are Illinois, Kansas, Nebraska, New Mexico, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Vermont, and Wisconsin. Now I'm going to talk about a person who was diagnosed. The reason I chose this person is because we share the same name. So I'm going to be talking about Karen Greenlee. And the main reason why she caught my attention was because we have the same name, but also because she is a woman. And like I previously said, only 10% of necrophiles are women. So this was interesting. Just to go over a little bit of her background, Karen Greenlee is an American criminal that was born in 1956. She is convicted of stealing a hearse and having sex with the body in the casket. She is considered to be the best known modern practitioner of necrophilia. She worked as an apprentice embalmer at the Memorial Lawn Mortuary in Sacramento, California. <sighs> On to 
On the day of December 17th in 1979, Karen Green Lee stole a 1975 Cadillac hearse containing a body of a 33-year-old man who died a week prior to this date. I actually do have, I printed out an interview, which I will go over a few things from here in a little bit, but she apparently was driving already to the funeral home, and when she saw the family, something took over. She turned around and decided to drive to the county next to her, or the, one of the following counties. Well, it was actually Sierra County. So the police found her in Sierra County where she had overdosed on codeine Tylenol. It was approximated that she had swallowed 20 pills in an attempt to commit suicide, but when they found her, she was still alive and they were able to pump her stomach. Along with the body being still in the hearse in the casket, and inside the casket, they found a four and a half page long letter where she confessed all of the necrophilic activities that she had done with this body, as well as confessing that she had had, um, she had performed sexual activities with 20 to 40, 20 to 40 other male corpses. Now, during this time in California, there was no law against necrophilia. So she was only charged with stealing the hearse and interfering with the funeral, the burial. Because of this, she was all she had to do was pay a fine of $255 and spend 11 days in jail, which is minimal. Um, also included in this, she had two years of probation where it was mandatory for her to go to therapy. The mother of the, the man whose body she was having the sexual intercourse with when she was found, um, tried to sue for a million dollars for emotional distress, but ended up settling for $117,000. Later on, Karen Greenlee went on to have an interview with Jim Morton, which is the paper that I printed out right now. And I will be going over a few things that she said that I found very interesting. So why did this, develop, why did this disorder develop in her? She claims that it has always been a part of who she is. Since a young age, she had developed a fascination and, quote-unquote, she ha she's had the attraction all of her life. How did it affect her? Initially, she was upset about how people treated her. Obviously, I said that she had tried to commit suicide, and I don't think anybody knew at the time that she had, when she had tried to commit suicide that she was a necrophile, but... After the word got out that she was, she was upset with the way people treated her. She thought she was being treated unfairly. Although, after the entire process, she decided to accept herself as she is, and now she's content and she's happy with herself. She just thinks that it's a part of her personality. I Before I give you guys my opinion over it, I did want to read some things over this interview that she had with Jim Morton just because it stood out to me a lot. Um, so as I said, she was charged with driving the hearse and interfering with the burial. When the letters that they found, well, the, the letter that they found that she had left, she did write, quote unquote, why did I do it? Why? Why? Fear of love, relationships, no romance ever hurt like this. It's the pits. I'm a morgue rat, and this is my rat hole. This is my rat hole, perhaps my grave. I did highlight some things, some additional things that I want to point out. Um, the question that she was most often asked is, how does she do it? And she did want to clarify that you don't have to have sexual intercourse. She says, besides, there are different aspects of sexual expression, touchy-feely, 69, even holding hands. That body is just lying there, but it has what it takes to make me happy. The cold, the aura of death, the smell of death, the funeral surroundings, it all contributes. When asked, the smell of death? She responded, sure. I find the odor of death very erotic. And then she describes, now you get your body that's been floating in a bay for two weeks or a bum victim, that doesn't attract me very much. But a freshly embalmed corpse, that's something else. Um, around this time, there was a lot of AIDS that was going around, 
And what I found very shocking is that her response was, that's the reason I haven't tried anything lately. I'm sure I'd found a way to get into one of those funeral homes by now, but the group I find attractive, young men in their 20s, are the ones who are dying of AIDS. And I thought this was very standoff. Stand, it stood out a lot to me because she was basically saying that if it wasn't for her fear of getting AIDS, then she would be breaking into these funeral homes. She also explained that she would drive out with the family and she would spend some time at the funeral. A lot of the family thought that this was very sweet of her, but obviously that wasn't the reason. She says, I'd get out and drive out to the cemetery with the family. I was groaning in a little different tone. People can't really tell if you're grief-stricken or passion-stricken. Obviously, she was passion-stricken. She also did admit that she was breaking into funeral homes at this time. When asked when she first became aware, aware of her necrophilia, she said, it's something I've been attracted to all my life. When asked if she missed working at funeral homes, she said that she did miss it terribly, except for obese people, she says. The bodies I hated working on the most were obese people, especially if they had been autopsied. Their guts would slide out on the floor and shit, and the melty fat everywhere. Yuck. Which I found surprising because although she is dealing with the corpse and blood and all of it, she thought that the fat leaking from people was disgusting. At a certain point, um, a funeral director did testify on the behalf of the funeral practices, and he said that it is almost unheard of in this profession for somebody to be a necrophile. Although Karen Greenlee did decide, or not decided, but she did say, necrophilia is more prevalent than most people imagine. Funeral homes just don't report it. They actually caught me in the act and let me get away. She was asked if she saw any change in people's attitudes towards necrophilia, and she just said, there's probably a lot of people who would do it if they had the opportunity, which I'm not too sure about, but that's what she said. When asked, is it frustrating when people say, we have to cure you, or you've got to be more like us? She spoke a little bit about people telling her that it wasn't normal and her feeling bad about herself for a long time because of how many people told her that she had to change or it wasn't normal and they had to fix her. But then she says, I realized necrophilia makes sense for me. The reason I was having a problem with it is because I, I couldn't accept myself. To accept it was peace. She also said that, as I explained, she was ordered to go to, the ther to therapy she says, I used to go from the therapist's office to the funeral home. It didn't work, folks. And that's all I'm going to say about her interview. Um, next, I'm asked for my opinion. <sighs> my opinion over necrophilia is just, I don't believe it's something that should be socially acceptable. I don't think it is something that should become normalized. I think that it's more it's morally reprehensible and very unsanitary. Generally very unsanitary. You don't know where these bodies have been. Obviously you're the one taking care of it. And then at the same time, I think that the family members would prefer that you don't do anything with the corpse of their loved ones out of respect because this is a profession and you are supposed to act like a professional in your profession. So that wraps up my presentation over necrophilia. I hope you guys learned something, are able to recognize a new name, and have some information to share to the next person. Thank you very much.